1991, I always open with a general question about that that year, that season in general. Uh, remembrances in general, was it a good season? Was it a good year for movies or not? Uh, I remember 91 vividly. Uh, it was a roller coaster uh, summer. I mean, like every summer, there's truly bad movies. Um, but then there's, you know, truly great movies. And then the ones in between, you know, you're surprised that, you know, you had the surprises. Uh, and so, you know, it was just, there was always seemed to be something interesting, good or bad. Even the, even the duds, which we'll get into, are kind of, they're more interesting than probably some of the duds that we have today. And uh, also, the I guess the two key trends starting to emerge in 91 is uh, the black new wave and indie movies uh, are really starting yeah. to come into their own uh, uh, that summer. I remember thinking that um, <clears throat> the movies were turning darker. You know, uh, you know, it was, you know, that summer was right after the uh, the hit of Silence of the Lambs, and and uh, I just, I, I, you know, things like, you know, uh, JFK was about to come up, and so that was that was all on everybody's minds, uh, you know. But you know, as as we'll see in the list, uh, which is shocking when you go over the list of movies in comparison to the kinds of movies that are coming out in the summer today it's just it's yeah. just like night and day because there was room for all kinds of movies uh, mm-hmm. uh in in the summer of 91 uh uh you know all kinds of studio movies uh and indies uh but uh it's it's just completely different now so and i mean you know You'll see, you know that there's there's a little bit of a dark tinge to things, uh, even in the summer films. So, um, but yeah, that was my yeah, absolutely memory. Right. I, I, I mean, uh, yeah, as, as opposed to the non-stop non-stop escapist fare that we get today, and a lot of the fare that we get today are are things that I'd like to escape from, <laughs> mm-hmm. not escape into. Jerry, what do you think? Yes. I, I think it's a very lukewarm summer. I think it's the beginning. I mean, you got to remember, this is the, the big movie of the summer is Terminator 2, the first $100 million movie um, to make. Yeah. You know, it cost $100 million to make. So that's the movie that hangs, like, over the whole summer. It, and, you know, and it still actually holds up okay by uh, today's standards. Do I think it's a darker summer, though? I don't know. I mean, what films are we talking about that we think are darker? That's what I'm really curious about. I mean, are we talking about Boys in the Hood, Jungle Fever? Are we, I mean, we sure as hell aren't talking yes. about Thelma and Louise. Journey. I mean, a, uh-huh. a, a summer movie that ends like Thelma and Louise. I mean, that. Uh, when was the last time we saw that? And Robin, uh, and but, the Robin Hood was, a, I mean, that got a lot of, as big a hit as it was, it got a lot of flack for not being a, you know, it was, it got, you know, it was the, the the selling point on on that Robin Hood was that it was a uh, the rough and tumble, gritty Robin Hood as opposed to the Errol Flynn, and there was a lot of talk of the violence in that Robin Hood. Uh, mm-hmm. And so yeah, and you know, it, it was kind of the uh, the the Batman, the Tim Burton Batman effect. The the adventure movies were getting a little. I mean, to the point the Rocketeer was was seen as square. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, and that was, was part, part of its failure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that is. I mean, The Rocketeer was not... I mean, I'm not one of these people that has a hankering for The Rocketeer. I could take or leave it um, back then or today. I, I don't really have any strong affinity for that movie. I don't really have much for the Robin Hood movie either, but I don't remember it being gritty or dark or anything. I just remember it being sort of... Um, you don't remember the POV of uh, Maid Marian's legs being spread apart as... Uh, as the sheriff yeah. of Nottingham was about to rape her? I, just don't, I didn't think much of it at the time because it just didn't leave much of an impact. It was sort of what I'd call PC Robin Hood, um, mm-hmm. thinking back at the time. Um, I didn't think much of it. I mean, one way or the other, I just thought it was sort of like, because um, it was Kevin Reynolds directed that, right? Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah we're I mean, it was like, we're, for, we're... for us, it was like Fandango Light. 
Um, if you really want me to be honest, truth, watching that movie. Um, I, I just don't, you know, when we think of dark, I just don't think of that Robin Hood. I don't even think of Thelma and Louise as dark. Um, I thought Thelma and Louise was very exhilarating, very liberating, mm. but dark was not, dark is not the word I would use to describe it, thinking back on yeah, you know, it's watching got, it. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's got an ending that uh, studios would change for being too dark nowadays. You, well, you will not have your two lead characters kill themselves at the end of any movie made today. <laughs> true, true, but I just don't... And dark is not the first word that comes to mind when thinking of that it, movie. Even if your movie uh, is called Suicide Squad, your two lead characters will not commit suicide. <laughs> well, suicide... I mean, that, we, and you won't have a movie called Dying Young being at the center of the... <laughs> at the center of the lineup. May 3rd, we have... And it, it should be noted that still at this time, summer is more or less kicking off on Memorial Day, but uh-huh. now now summer, but, you know, as opposed to now where summer is all year round. But mm-hmm. going at May 3rd, you can kind of feel them trying to stretch out the summer. Uh, maybe not this week, because this summer, May 3rd, we get One Good Cop, A Rage in Harlem, and Truly Madly, uh, Deeply, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. And nothing, Rage in Harlem is probably the best film in that lot. Uh, I'll uh, give you that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Although I, I have tremendous affection for Truly Madly Deeply, particularly for uh, the two lead performances, um, Juliet Stevenson and Alan Rickman, particularly yeah. Juliet Stevenson. Uh, it's kind of like the the better version of Ghost, uh, in my opinion. And, uh, of course, it was directed by Anthony Minghella, one of his first movies. So, so I, I and it's a movie that I really didn't discover until it came on VHS. I have right, to say. right. But yeah. uh, um, one good cop. That was a that was kind of a Michael <laughs> Keaton dad, right? Well, what, what, yeah. What, what, yeah. The sad part of one good cop it was a reteaming of uh, Michael Keaton with the uh, writer director Haywood Gould, and they'd actually made a good movie uh, five six years earlier called Touch and Go. Right. Uh, and so they reteamed, and I guess Michael Keaton was just maybe a little too loyal to him, and that movie was just pretty, just pretty bad. Although it had a really it, nice it, one good supporting performance by Anthony LaPaglia. One good cop reminds me of. Is it a Touchstone movie? Yes. yes. No, Hollywood. I think it's Hollywood. Okay. Pictures. I think it's an early oh, Hollywood. Oh, okay. Pictures. Okay. Hollywood well, Pictures. they're all owned by Disney, uh, yeah. so so they they were they were trying to be like the adult division of Disney, and I think. It started with something like Ruthless People or something years earlier. Yeah. But um, they came out with all of these bland dramas. Yeah. Uh, and that and, and One Good Cop fits that mold. And I remember, did. Michael Keaton was trying to, you know, he was in between Batmans. And so he was coming off of uh, Pacific Heights, another kind of yuppie thriller that really wasn't that good. Uh, and so then he just went on to Batman Returns, which was probably a smart move on his part. Uh, so then, uh, was May the Rage 10th. in Harlem? Was that was Rage in Harlem? Bill Duke. Who yeah, Bill Duke. Uh-huh. With okay. Whitaker and Robin Gibbons and Gregory Hines and it was Gary a, Glover. It was a really good movie. It's still, I think it actually still holds up very good, very well today. Actually, so I mean, yeah. So May tenth, we get FX two, and then the summer movie we get Madonna Truth or Dare. Uh, the Brian Brown film Sweet Talker and Ellen Barkin Switch. Now the best film of that four is Ma- the Madonna documentary Far and Away. Oh yeah. That, that that's uh it's that's just an amazing you know, that ranks with the uh, Bob Dylan, you know, don't don't look now. That's I have to I have to be honest, I've never I've never made the time to watch that. Uh it's, it's, it's fascinating. Oh my yeah. god, it's still fascinating. It's, it's um, Madonna at the peak of her power, the blonde ambition to her. Uh, you see her humanity, you see her power, you see her narcissism, uh, you see it all. Um, it's just, and you it's, see, you, know, you see, I, I know I've seen the scene with her, uh, her and Warren Beatty, with Warren Beatty backstage or something, and right. yeah. he's just kind of yeah. shrinking into the background. <laughs> there's Warren Beatty. There's the not, there's the lovely moment with her talking to her father on the phone, and he's wanting to see if she can get him tickets to a show, and she's like, "Yes, Dad, I can get you tickets." And 
Kevin Costner comes backstage and he, he says the show is neat. Uh, uh, it's, it's the rifle sequel to Dick Tracy. Yeah. I mean, it's the, it really is the rifle <laughs> sequel. Um, I mean, the other movies you mentioned, though, it's the same that FX2, which they're really shit. I mean, the first one was so good, and this one was just so blah. Um, or Switch, which just was another nail in Ellen Barkin's coffin at the time, I thought. Well, I I can defend Switch. Switch is redeemed by a great Ellen Barkin performance in a script that doesn't want to go as far as the audience is wanting it to go. Right. I, Switch, I, I, I'll give you that to an extent, but was, I mean... If Switch was done today, and you know, in the age of Caitlyn Jenner, you know, in the era of Caitlyn Jenner and stuff, yeah. I, I think Switch could be an amazing film. <laughs> That's time for a remake. Barkin does give an amazingly physical performance in that film. I just wish the script was a little more. It doesn't play with the sexuality of it that it could have. Mm-hmm. Well, and when you think about when you think about Ellen Barkin, I mean, she was such a unique presence there was something mm-hmm. so kind of brassy and ballsy about her and mm-hmm. i get the sense that most filmmakers probably did not know what to do with her because she was so authentic and tough yeah and the closest they could cut co- the closest they could come to figuring out what to do with her was to have her play a man mm-hmm. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah i mean probably would have willing, absolutely right and she probably would have been willing to go further than the script than the script wanted it to go but uh mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the script only went so far. Following week, we have... Oh, this is amazing. We'll have a nice little... Here, here's a good discussion. Uh, we got Dice Rules. <laughs> Mannequin 2 on the move. <laughs> Stone Cold. Oh, man. And what about Bob? Now... Well, the, the last one's a classic. There's no doubt about I, that. I, 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 I like What About Bob. I was never... Crazy about what about Bob? Just because, um, I personally I have a problem. I stories about you know guests who don't go away. You know, <laughs> they Not really my favorite thing. They really get under my skin like that. You, me, it, and Dupree, and does other it feel types. like? Is it, does it feel like? I mean, first it's kind of like irritainment. It's not really entertainment. It's irritainment. And uh, it's, does it feel more like just sort of like a one joke kind of thing that's pounded into the pounded it, in the ground for you? It, it, it's it is irritating and it, it's 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 the irritation and nine times out of ten I wind up siding with the person who's being irritated. Um, mm. The only you know th- though I, I think the, there is a little difference in what about Bob in that <clears throat> they do make. Uh, Richard Dreyfus into such a ass wipe. Yeah, that, well, the, uh, the that you kind of want to see him get it. Well, I think they, they do a good job of that. They're both, and plus they make uh, Bill Murray not too irritating. He's got other sides of him that are uh, that are kind of charming. The, the, to me, yeah. the only film that's ever done it right is. Uh, Chuck and Buck, and so I mean, yes, it's funny. I do laugh. It's I I actually laugh more with Julie Haggerty, the Julie Haggerty stuff. I think she's kid, funny in it, yeah. And the kids are good. I I always like Charlie Cosmo. I was always a good good actor. Right, uh, right. But you know, I I remember the film was a big surprise hit when it came out. I and I just thought it was kind of it was funny, but I didn't. Think and people it was, still like it. People still like yeah. it, and they still oh, talk yeah, about it. it. I beloved, watched it a, a couple of weeks comedy. ago. The, the lost movie there is Stone Cold, obviously. You really you think so? I mean, <laughs> no. that's um now that is the one with um with the boss or whatever his name yeah. was. I mean, that yeah. was his I can say his ticket into the action world, his one one way ticket, and that was it. Um, yeah. He got stamped and he got returned. Um, and then of course, <laughs> Dice Rules was we all know that was a film that was on the shelf for about a year, and then they just ceremoniously. Dropped it, this you know, because by the summer of '91, Dice Fever had kind of just oh, it's gone. Is, is that a concert yeah. movie? Yeah, that's his concert movie. Yeah, when I was in college, there are two people that um, people that guys look up to. 
one was Dice Clay, and the other one is the Republican nominee for president right now, um, Donald Trump. They were both very popular in 89 and 90. The art of the deal was went hand-in-hand with that um, comedy CD that Andrew Dice Clay released. You know, both loud, brash, obnoxious pieces of shit. Um, one had talent, the other one doesn't. Um, but it's very interesting they're both in the public eye again. Yeah, Trump and I think that Dice Clay uh, has done a good job yeah. at kind of re- redefining. I mean, he was great in the Woody Allen movie, and I, yeah. I would Perf. love to see if I would I would love to see him follow that track. I don't think he should fully embrace the old Dice persona again. I think he's been there. I think he needs to reach another level. And Dice is right on one point. He uh, I remember when he was doing interviews around the time of Blue Jasmine. He says, you know, now. What's amazing is that now female comics have, you know, they're now doing my material, and yeah. it is true. The the you know, you listen to someone like Lisa Amy Lampanelli, Sch- yeah, yeah. Or a- Amy Schumer or Ali Wong, uh, Jenny Slate. I mean, oh yeah, I mean these are all, all yeah, they're, they're all the daughters of Dice, and it's kind of amazing. Mm. Uh, the good. Daughters of Dice. That would be a good movie. No, that's, I want to make that movie. It's like Daughters <laughs> that's, of Dracula. That's, a, that's a whole tour. That's a whole, that's a, you know. Uh, <laughs> so now now we come to Memorial Day weekend. So this is the real weekend. We didn't weekend, even so. talk about Mannequin 2, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to, I mean, a little... I mean, did you no. watch it in the theater? I didn't see it in the theater. Not, I don't even know if I watched it. I can't, I can't remember the second one. I remember the first one very Nothing's vividly. Gonna, Nothing's going to stop us from talking about it. (laughs) Is is this the movie with Nothing's Going to Stop Us Now? The first one. It was the first one, okay. Hmm. All right. Uh, What was the song from this one? (laughs) I don't know. Funky funky Cold Medina, maybe. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe. Maybe. That could be it. So Memorial Day weekend, finally we get a bunch of movies. We get Backdraft. Uh, what do we get? We get Backdraft, Hanging with the Homeboys, Hudson Hawk, uh, Only the Lonely, Thelma and Louise, and Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken. Now, what I find interesting about this, a couple of things. One is that the two big films, Backdraft and Thelma and Louise, are R-rated. Um, and they're both, you could say, I mean, obviously Backdraft was sold as an action film, like, you know, this, as an action film, but really it's a, it's an ensemble drama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so is Dumb and Louise, they're both, it's a two-hander drama. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, um, I would say the best of the, of that lot is probably Thelma and Louise, followed by Backdraft. Uh, Backdraft gets kind of dumped on a lot just because Ron Howard gets dumped on a lot. I think we're, I think we're finally going to get into that point in his career of Ron Howard revisionism, uh, which is something I've been doing for a long time. I've always thought he's an underrated director. His He may not be a flashy director, uh, but he's one of the top three, four directors when it comes to hand, wrangling ensembles. Mm-hmm. Uh, Backdraft is a good example of that. And uh, Thelma and Louise is is uh, Earthbound Ridley Scott, and like Max Dickman, and it's what's really good. And I guess the underrated one of that group is only the Lonely. I would agree with that. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think yeah. that that's that's one of John Candy's best performances, and and also it's uh, is it Maureen O'Hara that's playing his uh, yeah. mother or Margaret yeah. O'Sullivan or. I can't remember now. I, think, yeah. I can't remember either. I'm, I'm not in front of a computer, but it's the movie that I, you know, it's how do I say? It's the movie that's only grown in stature since his death. I mean, when after he died, that was the film that people were like, "Wow, he really, he really gave it his all in that movie." Um, that Maureen movie. O'Hara. Had, Maureen O'Hara. By the way. Well, John yeah. Hughes knew, you know, oddly enough, John Hughes probably knew uh, Candy's range better than anyone. And so he mm-hmm. could write for him both comically, and shows that only the lonely. Uh, well, in fact, well, it's actually a Chris Columbus movie. <laughs> so I mean, Hughes might be in there as a producer, but uh, it's as uh, as the writer and director is Chris Columbus. 
Well, right, well, same right. thing. I mean, they mm. pro- they 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 both probably knew. Um, mm. But uh, but well, I let think me just say I this think, um, uh, about uh, Thelma and Louise. There are very few m- movies. You're lucky if you get one a year that become become a cultural event. The Summer mm-hmm. Louise, I think, out of all of the movies from the summer, was that. It, it yeah. did become a statement. It did become a statement about feminism, female empowerment, and and even the and then the detractors of the movie said, "Is this really the movie we want to hang those themes on? I mean, is it good enough to hold up like a female empowerment or a, a, a pro-feminism message?" Um, so th- there was a lot of discussion going around the periphery of the movie itself, as the movie kind of drew out. I, I I agree with all that, but I want to also add something about another thing about Thelma and Louise. That's like Ridley Scott's biggest box office success to date, and he had not oh. had success after Alien. Remember, Blade Runner was more of a cult film. A uh, legend was a dud financially. Um, you know. Someone to watch over me, um, and, and Black Rain was okay. But remember, Thelma and Louise was just the lifeline that gave Ridley Scott a whole new life in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Let's not forget that. We we forget mm-hmm. that now. And um, it, it allowed him to squander it on 1492. Yeah, yeah. Or... He, 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 a movie where you could disappear for an hour in the bathroom and not miss anything, as I can I can uh, <laughs> make testament to. Um, talk about a movie where nothing happens. Um, but let's not forget that. That was the movie that gave Ridley. Yeah. That's why we still have Ridley Scott. If it wasn't for that movie, I don't think we'd be talking about Ridley Scott today. And, and it's not a movie you'd expect from Ridley Scott. And I, right. I, I watched it again. I watched it again probably a couple of months ago. And um, it is very good. Michael Madsen is very charming in it. I mean, he finds a way to soften Michael Madsen right. without mm-hmm. demasculating him. Uh, you know, and, and Harvey Keitel is. Pitt. Harvey Keitel's terrific. Yeah, it, and that's another thing. I mean, this is the year that Harvey Keitel is like has a comeback between this and Mortal Thoughts. Um, he plays the um, these like supporting parts that really give him into a whole new generation of moviegoers. But not, I mean, this movie the women is very are, the women are of course wonderful. I'm uh, yes. the, uh, you know uh, among the big stories of the movie was a screenwriter Kaylee Couric, um, yeah. and. I don't know. I'm sure that she had in mind a bigger career than she actually had. It reminds me of Diablo Cody, who was the big story of Juno, really. Right. Um, and I, I don't know if her career has turned out quite like people had hoped for, even though if she's working, I'm sure she's thrilled. Um, you know, so that's something yeah. to think about. The, uh, but it probably had been 28 days. Well, that probably both of those cases probably underline, you know, the difficulties that female screenwriters have in making inroads and and well, and getting the, and getting female stories told. Really, uh, that's probably yeah. the biggest uh, hill to climb. Uh, you know, I mean, Thelma and Louise luckily had they had an action, uh, an action, um, a large action element to it, so. Uh, so it's probably a little easier, but uh... but Diablo <laughs> Cody's done well. I mean, she just did great, the great script for Ricky and the Flash last year. Uh, the thing, she's a self-generating talent. She, you, you, know, you really want to bring up Ricky and the Flash with Dean on the show? No, oh, man, <laughs> I hated that movie. <laughs> Mm. I love that movie. I'm, I'm not a fan of of her of Diablo Cody's work in general. I think because mm. I'm but not a fan of we're we're ignoring the elephant in the room that weekend, which was Hudson Hawk. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, kind of, I guess I don't know what the Suicide Squad of its day, except it actually did bomb. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just not. I don't even know if that statement makes sense. I mean, it's just not a it's it's not a good movie. It, and it started this trend that is that has only accelerated in the last in the last generation of fan fanboydom. Of uh, any film with enough time will get reevaluated, and they'll be like, "No, it's actually good." When <laughs> when actually no, it's not. No, it's, it's not. not. No, Hudson it's Hawk not. is just like David Lynch's Dune. It's not good. 
uh, love David Lynch. Dune is not good. We can hope, we can hope. <laughs> Although I get through Dune yeah. just by watching everything, like watching all the the costumes and the sets and stuff. But well, it's it's not Dune really is actually movie. a better film than Hudson Hawk. Well, I understand yeah. what you're saying, but but let's talk, let's talk. You bring up a great point there, and this this whole this revitalization that we have, reevaluating these films that it should not be reevaluated. Um, and you compare it to Suicide Squad, which I find interesting because I just don't think Suicide Squad. Here's the thing. Here's the big difference between Hudson Hawk and Suicide Squad. We'll still be talking about Hudson Hawk in five years. But no one's <laughs> going to talk about Suicide Squad. <laughs> I just don't. I don't mean. I mean that. Well, here's here's the thing. The here's the thing with the Hudson movie. Hawk that makes this is what makes Hudson Hawk interesting to me. It's the same reason why Cobra is interesting to me. Except Cobra, I think, is an unintentionally great movie. <laughs> Hudson Hawk is a product of a lead actor's ego run amok. Mm-hmm. That's what I see when I watch Hudson Hawk, and that's what makes it an interesting case study for me. Let's throw yeah, everything I would to agree. the wall. I would agree. Let's see, let's, mm-hmm. let's see what sticks. Uh, we can get away with it because this guy is in a position to do whatever he wants. Uh, 90% of it doesn't stick. About 10% of that movie has some, has some good laughs in it and some joyous moments. Timing the heist to the song, the duet right. that he and Danny Aiello do, it mm-hmm. works beautifully. It's a ballsy kind of thing to put in the movie, and I thought it worked beautifully. Uh, everything else does not, really. And the thing is, it's Michael Lehman, the director, and this is a guy who gets his shot at a big film coming off of the very, uh, you know, sarcastic uh, Heathers, uh, which, you know, whatever you may think of Heathers, I mean, he, I mean, he was an original voice with that movie. And so here he is with a yeah. studio film, The Star, and it just, you know, it's just And it was unfair to him. I mean, I, I mean, because... He got that. Uh, he took that failure on the, you know, hardest. I think of all. I, I know right. that Bruce Willis gets bad press, but Bruce Willis, he's a major star. He can come back with another movie. It's a lot harder for Michael Lehman to do that. Right. Uh, so I do think that it did hinder or alter the course of Lehman's career for the worse. Well, the uh, I just want to put in a two cents real quick on hanging with the homeboys which this was its original release date, but actually came out a few weeks later because this summer had a lot of, was probably the first summer where we had a lot of uh, uh, quote-unquote black movies that came out. And so mm-hmm. Hollywood didn't know, they didn't want to stack stagger them. But Hanging with the Homeboys was actually one of the better ones. It was kind of a an inner-city diner. Unfortunately, the director died of AIDS a couple of years later. And, oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. And um, so he had this film. He wrote he wrote one section of the Showtime movie Riot, about the L.A. riots. Mm-hmm. That's really, 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 really good. And Hang With the Homeboys is also noteworthy. You don't know. It has a really nice restrain, and I, I use that word uh, really well because it's, you, you don't you don't associate it with, with this actor. It has a very restrained performance by John Leguizamo. Um, so Hang With the Homeboy is actually a really oh. good lost little movie from that from that same okay. week. No, no, that's a good. It's a good movie. I mean, it's a, it's a very mm-hmm. tight little movie. So I mean, it definitely deserves mm-hmm. to be talked about on this show. Mm-hmm. So the following week we get Soap Dish, which uh, uh-huh. I've always liked. Uh, big cast, big comedy. Kevin Klein, good showcase for Kevin Klein and uh, Sally Field. And I always thought it was very, very funny satire on soaps. Mm-hmm. So, um, wasn't a big comedy hit, uh, but it has its following now. Soap opera culture was a lot more pronounced back then in 91 than it is today. Yeah. Uh, I think. Um, I mean, you have 50-year-old shows that ha- are not on anymore because they are not ratings for them. Right. So I, I wonder if that satire would play... The same today. I don't. I don't know if it would. I don't think it would. I, I don't. I don't. They would have to. They would have to. <clears throat> you know, move it to the rea- reality TV or something like that. To, right. To, to make I it work. Or something. Or right. something like. Or something like a Telemundo kind of 
which is what Eva Longoria tried to do with her primetime show, and that didn't work. Right. You know, the soaps on Telemundo. I, I, I really don't think that the... Uh, the soap um, revolution, you know, the the soap uh, opera movement or whatever. I just don't think it connects with that many people, really. I mean, well, not anymore. the people Even that it does satire. connect with, they're watching soaps. They're not. Uh, I, don't, I just, I don't know. <laughs> they're not Even leaving the house. Satire of reality <laughs> TV uh, is having a hard time connecting with people. That that show on A and E was it unreality or whatever? Unreal. Yeah. I mean, Unreal. supposedly people, supposedly it's good, but. The ratings uh, are diminishing from season one to season two. So mm. the thing, is, the question is, why why watch a satire of a soap on re- or you know reality TV when you can just watch the real thing when it's already Me- ridiculous enough? And it's and it's already uh, almost a satire of itself, you know. Yeah. These two places, these two uh, movements. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I personally, I've never watched Soap Dish because it just doesn't look like my cup of tea really although i'll tell you uh gary 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 marshall is in it and i love him so much as an actor uh and uh that was one of the main things i i lamented when he passed earlier this year uh was his value as an actor and so and so i wish he he had done more stuff and people reminded me of uh soap dish and also of um uh, his role on uh, what was the the uh, Candace Bergen show? Murphy, Murphy Brown. Brown. Murphy Brown. Murphy yeah. Brown. But he's, he's, and, great, uh, in, he's and, great in Lost in America. His one scene yeah. in Lost, Lost in America. And early on, he was a very fine commercial filmmaker, uh, Flamingo Kid. And it's just as a coincidence, I had picked up the Blu-ray of Nothing in Common, literally like two weeks before he passed. Mm. Um, and nothing in common is a, is a terrific movie. Oh, it, yeah, with a great. Sound I think that's what killed him. <laughs> yeah. And then the uh, fact that you and, bought that Blu-ray, I think that's what did him in. <laughs> yeah, okay. like, oh my God, someone bought this. I mean, <laughs> the first week of June, this is a good weekend. Like I said, we got City Slickers, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, and Jungle Fever. Now, wow, something for everybody. Yeah, yes. I mean that was that's a great. You don't have those. You don't have you, any of these. That's great. two out of that's two out of three re, uh, great movies. Uh, City Slickers and Jungle Fever. Don't tell mom. It it could be a little. It's like a wannabe John Hughes movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though Christine Applegate's really charming in it, really cute in it. But she gets better as she gets older. I mean, right. let's be honest, I mean, she really finds her funny bone, like her real. Talents after Married with Children. I think we can all agree yeah. that she gets better once that show is off the air. But uh, City Slickers, I think, is actually a great American comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, it was one of those. Uh, and Jungle Fever uh, is one. Is a, according to Jerry, it's a light movie. Uh, well, it's not a light. Yeah, it's not a light. I'm not saying it, but it's, it's. Let me put it to you like this, though. I mean, that's that is truly a great Spike Lee film. Uh, he don't make them like that anymore. Well, uh, it's funny. I, I saw that a while back, and um, and it's the same. It, it's an almost great Spike Lee film because uh, the problem with it is that uh, the leads are the weakest thing in it. They, that's exactly right. That's exactly it. But it's who all is the, great in that? It, who is it's great? The, it's the supporting performances that really land with you. Like it's all it's all the fallout of their affair that yeah. makes the movie exciting. Their mm. romance is is really it's rather excuse. tepid. It's yeah. an excuse. Yeah, no, it's 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 it's, it's Samuel L. Jackson's um, hmm. um, performance is just um, Sam Jackson. and Halle Berry yeah. too. The scene where they where he kills his son. It, it, still to this day, it's one of the most heart wrenching scenes. I just oh, I, tr- yeah. I tried to watch the movie a, a couple of months ago, and I had to fast forward through it because I just I just knew that it was it was too heartbreaking for me to watch. That subplot I think is the among the very best thing that Spike Lee's ever done. I yeah. think the weakness of the movie the weakness of the movie is its central premise because I think everyone's on a different page about what it means. Now, is it just a mystique that draws her to him, or is it true love, 
and vice versa. Uh, I don't think they ever come to any kind of conclusion, so it feels very confused. Uh, like, they're not on the same page. I know that Annabella Sciorra disagreed completely with Spike Lee about how to portray that relationship, and I think that's what shows in the movie. And um, and the crack house sequence is probably one of the great sequences of that mm-hmm. year. Yeah. Uh, the use mm-hmm. of, just of Montag and the use of the Stevie Wonder song and a terrific cameo by uh, Charlie Murphy as a drug yeah. dealer living large. Uh, right. And, 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 a, and a good Stevie Wonder soundtrack. I love yeah, that hey, Stevie it, Wonder soundtrack. Guys, would it be, and you can edit this out, Jamie, if you want, but this movie came out um, a year after My City's Mayor was caught on, on video, um, busted for, you know, a lot of things, but for crack cocaine, uh, Mary and Barry, but his son today yeah. um, passed away from a drug overdose. Yeah, mm. Mary and Barry's well, that's, son that's died. Well, that's today. another thing. Yeah, I read that about his son, and that's another thing about Spike Lee's movies. To a large extent, his movies are a stew of different elements. Mm-hmm. Maybe they'll go together, maybe they won't. I mean, the the one that doesn't go together for me is the um, the one where he sells his body out. It's about the economic fallout. Anthony Mackie. Which oh, one is? What's me. that one called? She hates me. She hates me. Oh, oh, she hates me. Those those are two. Those are two totally different kinds of themes he's working on, and he's trying to connect them, and it doesn't work. But in right. something like Jungle Fever, uh, you know, crack mm-hmm. epidemic was huge at that time. Right. Um, and he throws that in there, and it does feel organic, of course, to that Samuel Jackson subplot and how it affects Wesley Snipes and his family. Right. Uh, also, the very, the very last scene of Jungle Fever, the very last shot, is so powerful and operatic. Yeah. And it leaves you kind of breathless, like, oh, like a gut punch. Uh, it's, uh, that movie is half of the absolutely brilliant, uh, just harrowing experience for me. Mm-hmm. It's just, and it is a time capsule. If you really want to know what was going on at a, a certain point in uh, New York and then, therefore, parts of the country in summer of 90 and 91... Mm-hmm. You know, you just go look at Jungle Fever, and it has, it it just captures a moment. Even the clothes, I mean, the clothes are of the moment. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes. You know, the fashion, the hair, you know, yeah. the lingo, the music, it's all literally of the moment. Even the girl talk, the girl talk is a total, you know, Oprah moment. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just... You're absolutely you know, right, Aaron, you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, mm-hmm. about City Slickers... I remember going to go see Bobcat Goldthwait in concert that year, and I, it must have been around this time because the very first thing he said when he went on stage, he said, "City Slickers is the big hit uh, today. Uh, it's about four yuppies who go out in the woods to find their smile." He said, "Finally, a movie made for people just like me." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was an early David Paymer um, performance, mm-hmm. one of the Ice Cream Brothers. And it's a good showcase for actually for Daniel Stern. Um, but su- superb yeah. for him. I mean, from yeah. what I remember, I mean, yeah. he really came yeah. into his own in that movie. Yeah. yeah but of course, the... it was it was it was the showcase for Jack Palance. Like oh, yes. the, the the most unex- unexpected story to come out of that movie was his Oscar mm-hmm. win and his reemergence. I mean, just just from that one movie, it wasn't capitalized right. on, but mm. you know, he had that mm. resurgence because of that movie. Well, the following week, we have uh, Bright Angel, Kickboxer 2, and Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Now, by default, Bright Angel is the good movie of that bunch. Um, the director never came to much after that, unfortunately, but it's a good... Could you re... re, re could you re, What was that? I don't remember Bright Angel. Could you... Um... Uh, Lily Taylor and uh, Sam Shepard and Dermot Maroney has kind of a... Days of Heaven kind of vibe. They're kind of just wandering I through. I vaguely remember yeah. it. I'd have to go back and watch it again, though, and I'd be more than happy to, uh, yeah. to watch it. Robin Hood was kind of one of those deals. It, I, funny thing about Robin Hood, I did not see it in theaters, not because I didn't want to. It's just one of those films every week, like, oh, let's go see Robin Hood. And then, like, the other film that opened that week, like, took precedent over mm-hmm. Robin Hood. 
and so I just never got to it. And the thing is, that if you go look at the charts, the box office mojo charts, Robin Hood stayed in the top ten literally that whole summer. It just did I'm telling not... you, I'm telling you, man, Robin Hood was a huge hit. Yeah. Robin Hood was the first movie I could remember that was still playing in theaters when it came out on video. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just kept. That, it just, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, that doesn't happen. Where that well, you got it, and it was, it, had, it was basically it was the star effect because literally what three months earlier, Costner had just won uh, best yeah. director for Dance with best picture mm-hmm. for Dance with Wolf, so he could do no wrong. Now, and it's interesting. This is where we get an early inkling of backlash culture because Robin Hood goes and opens to twenty five million dollars. It was a big weekend at the time, but the review, you know, so everyone was going, but the reviews were scathing on the film. Yeah. And to the point, it was like they were, it was one of it was one of those cases of uh, critics were re-reviewing Costner, the 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 star, through the movie, and it was kind of unfair. Just you know, he was miscast, wasn't very good in it. But there seemed to be a lot of tis tisking of is this guy overrated? Um, to me, the worst thing about uh, the worst thing about it, and the thing that made me like cut it off and me- almost immediately was his performance. Was just I just cannot take a performer who <clears throat> is playing supposedly with an accent and can't keep the accent. It just it 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 drives me nuts. It's one of my big pet peeves. It's something that I think, you know, ruined, for instance, uh, Lady Hawk and uh, because of Matthew Broderick's performance uh, and has ruined other um, Kevin Costner uh, movies. You know, I mean, it comes close to ruining, uh, you know, 13 Days for me for with his bo- terrible Boston accent. He just can't do accents. Very well, are you trying to say that his made-up character in Thirteen Days is? I mean, it's that up. It's an imaginary character. It's like the it's like the it's like the bunny from Good Night Moon is in the movie all of a sudden. But um, <laughs> but no, no. Can I can I say something about Robin Hood though? Are we all forgetting the elephant in the room? The Patrick Bergen Uma Thurman TV movie on Fox. Remember Fox had those TV movies they were making like that summer. Oh yeah, they rushed that one to compete, and you know it was just you could tell it was a rush job to. You know, Robin Hood was like the, you know, it was the Pavlovian effect, like Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Robin Hood. So they, I mean, they, it was TNT actually. I remember that. Uh, okay, yeah, but, but but remember that was actually that was not a bad movie. If I'm not, that Patrick Patrick Bergen was actually very good. Now it's not the same league with Robin Hood Men in Tights, though. Let's not get let's not get our carried away here. That's the best of all the modern Robin Hood. You know, the, the best Robin Hood, you know, obviously other than the Earl Flynn. Is actually the last ten minutes of the Ridley Scott Robin Hood. The last ten minutes of the Ridley Scott Robin Hood is just, really, really good. Just and, the last ten minutes. Yeah, what about yeah, the rest of it? It's, it's, it's <laughs> slow, no, it's, man. It's, it's, it's hard to sit through it. It's, and I saw that on a midnight screening of that movie. And it's, but Aaron yeah. is absolutely right. The last ten minutes of that movie are, um, if only the first. If the, the rest of the movie could have been that good. Um, if the first two hours and 20 minutes were only yeah. as good as the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, crazy. It's, it's where my colon is in such agony. Um, yes, yeah, you're absolutely right, Aaron. If only the, the rest of the movie could have been that good. Um, and Robin Hood, let's also remember Robin, and people, you know, why was Robin Hood such a hit? Obviously it was Costner. It had a big cast because it was Morgan Freeman. Christian Slater, who was up and, and coming, and Alan Rickman, and Alan let's Rickman. Not, let's was not his, forget, he was superb. Name, he, he's a he strong name boy. recognition. Yeah, it was his first villain role since Die Hard. But this is also a case of I, I believe, and I remember as a kid, I remember the impression I got of it, of the trailer selling you the movie. Because remember, the mm. trailer had that big moment of the POV of the arrow. Right, and, right, right. That's and we had. Right. The, You'd never seen anything like that in a in a in a movie, and I remember that I saw. I remember that's all anyone was talking about when that when that trailer hit was the POV. And era. by the way, uh, I mean, uh, don't underestimate the power of a popular song too. Oh yeah, Brian. Oh not, yeah. 
you could not get away from everything I do. I do it for you. Oh, that's God. probably the best thing about it. In my 19, I, I like 1995, the um, I worked at Crown Books, and the manager, I, I love that song. It's my all-time favorite song. I wanted to slip <laughs> my wrist after she said that. Because, <laughs> what, you were listening to punk and everything, right? I was listening to punk and metal and rap and everything. I wouldn't have gotten any of the song from Robin and Prince of Thieves. I mean, well, I, I, put it, I put it right up there with, um, and I love Brian Adams. I, I like him a lot. But I put it right up there with I don't want to miss a thing from Aerosmith in that it got so annoying. I don't want to hear yeah. even the opening bar of this ever again. <laughs> All right. Well, the following week, uh, we got Dying Young, we got The Rocketeer, and Suburban Commando. Once again, Ooh. by default, The Rocketeer is the better movie. Joe Johnson is one of those directors who's probably... I love the idea of Joe Johnson, but most of his movies always seem to come up just a couple of feet short mm-hmm. than what they could be. Uh, Rocketeer is a lot of, is like I said, very square fun. The thing about Dying Young, which is interesting, like Costume with Robin Hood, this was the Julia Roberts effect because just right. four months earlier. Uh, I mean, she had the, the, the hit of the spring of sleeping with the enemy. Uh, and now she's in this, you know, this film, which was, you know, positioned as the summer weepy, the summer, you know, the, you know basically it was positioned as the summer's ghost kind of thing. And it just doesn't uh, work. In you know what's interesting? G- Dying, Young, Dying Young is a good experiment. Well, not a good experiment, but it's an interesting one. Can you put... Well, people watch the world's biggest actress in anything. Uh, Julia Roberts looks stunning in the movie. She's gorgeous in right. the movie. Uh, and Joel Schumacher knows how to film faces, mm-hmm. knows how to film sexiness, you know. But uh, you're sticking her in a movie called Dying Young. Well, people go see a movie called Dying Young. <laughs> if that movie had a different title, not changing a frame of the movie, I bet it would have done a little bit better. It would have. I don't know. Yeah. I. 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 That exactly. I mean, I can't say it any better. It's just, you know, right. why would it, why would it, people go see this movie? I. I did go see it. Uh, I. I have to say, and uh, it was. Uh, it was a slog. It was well, a slog. It, 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 yeah. It, it, if the movie, if the movie were called Love Story, people would go see it. If it's called Dying Young, people <laughs> what about Dying Young? What about dying young love story? Now that well, I, I well, think the thing that is, Campbell <laughs> Scott, Campbell Scott is not a warm presence. Yes, he, he's a lot of he's a, he's a he's a good actor, but he's never been warm. You needed you needed a warm you needed someone with, you know, someone you actually, you know, here's a good question: Do do you want him? Not, do you want the person not to die? And so you don't want Ally McGraw to die. You could you could care less if Campbell Scott makes it or not. Campbell Scott doesn't have nearly the amount of warmth as his father did. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> oh I mean, God. his dad was all cuddly and hardcore. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah he's very cuddly. On the 28th, right. we get... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to touch on The Rocketeer again. Okay. I mean, like, is, it, is, is this a movie... Is, is this a movie that deserves re-evaluation these days? Because I, I I do think it's an important sort of brick in that whole. Uh, even though it was a you know somewhat of a financial failure, um, I do feel like it's a brick in that in the in the ascendance of uh, superhero movies. Yeah, uh, it's getting so, a re- it's getting a reboot. I mean, as we speak, it is getting a there is a reboot coming, from what I understand. Hmm. I, didn't, I, I didn't know there was a reboot. Well, no, there, what is, I remember there is liking, actually a sequel or something coming. What I remember liking about it, I just kind of like, like I said, I like the squareness of it. The whole, you know, the you know the whole Nazi, you know, subplot. You know that they want these rockets to come across the Atlantic. Uh, mm-hmm. I thought Timothy Dalton was actually a lot of fun, um, and so Jennifer Connelly. I think it Dalton, kind of it does kind of fall down with Billy Campbell as the lead. I mean, like there's just something yeah. sort of. Yeah, sort I mean, of, 
blah it's not about a him. Bad movie. It's just not a. I mean, it's, it's trying to just capitalize on this. You know, in the nineties, you get this whole retro, starting with Big Tracy, the Rocketeer, and the Phantom, then the Shadow. You know, yeah. that's what happens. You know, and that same that same thing, by the way, is going on this summer with Tarzan and a couple of years ago, John Carter and the Lone Ranger. It's like yeah. Hollywood does not learn that stuff from the early last century just isn't going to work. It's not going to yeah. work today. But it's so it's so, so interesting uh, the this, this slate of superhero movies that we're talking about because they are largely square and old fashioned, including, of course, Dick Tracy. But they all emanated from the popularity of Batman. And Batman was the anti those movies. Uh, so I, I think people were just so wrapped up in seeing a different, darker version of those movies that yeah. the Rocketeer didn't have a chance. I mean, going back to a wholesome, kind of serialized form. The message they learned is, oh, they like comic books. They didn't realize, oh, we need to make this, uh, re- we need to put a new spin on the comic book, which is what Tim Burton right. did. Now, yeah, Dick Tracy is, exactly. is Dick Tracy is obviously very square, but Warren Beatty did put a spin on it. I mean, he might be bland in the movie, but everything around him is pretty... It's you know, a very so, colorful yeah. movie, though. It's a, yeah. very, it's a very beautiful movie, yeah. but it's also Warren Beatty. And I say this as I, I finally saw, like, on the big screen, a trailer yesterday or the day before for um, the new Warren Beatty film, which I, I don't know what to think of, guys. I have no idea what to think of. But, um... <laughs> How about just how about just a long series of Z's? Yeah. <laughs> there, there is that. I mean, for, for for being not just that, but for the implications of the movie and the other actors in the movie, I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. This mm-hmm. is what we've been waiting for. Couldn't Jack Nicholson be in the movie at this point? I mean, <laughs> it's just anything. Hell, I'd pick Jack Bob Todd at this moment. Um, but never mind. Jack Nicholson the is thing not about, coming back. The thing about Jack... the Rocketeer that really keeps me going through it, just like in in Dick Tracy, is the design of the movie. I mean, the design of the sets and the costumes is so is so magnificent, and it's all it's all photographed fairly well. But uh, it really keeps me going. Uh, although I, I remember. Not feeling incredibly excited by the movie, but just uh, just uh, pleased with its look, you know. Yeah. Which is kind of the same way I felt about Dick Tracy, frankly. Yeah. So. Yeah. so the following week we have the art, the the foreign film hit of the summer, Europa Europa, by Neska Holland, uh, and Naked Gun Two and a Half: The Smell of Fear. <laughs> I'm actually. A I I'm could actually, talk about both of these at, at, for a long time. Um, I'm a fan of Naked Gun too. I, I think it's a funny, funny, funny movie, and I mean, it's. I miss those kind of movies. If that makes sense, I miss. I miss those kind of movies. We don't have those kind of movies anymore. Those kind of comedies. Well, those. I mean, they were the only guys that could do it reasonably well. Let's put it that way. Them and and I guess. To a certain extent, like Pat Proft and that kind of right. crew that did, uh, you know, that did some of the Hot Shots movies and stuff like that. But uh, but nowadays, the the only equivalent that we have is like the scary movie uh, and not kind even of movies, people. It's just a series of gags. They're not even there's no coherent storyline. At least in the three Naked Gun movies, you have actually a coherent storyline. Right. You don't even yeah. have that now. You like. Remember in the mid, what are we calling it? What do we call the first decade of the 21st century, the aughts? Is that what we call it? Yes. Okay, so remember we had like date movie, epic movie, disaster movie? Remember right. Remember those? Hard, I mean, if you remember them, I feel sorry for you because I'm trying to forget them. But, um, <laughs> you know, but, you know, we don't even have, those movies were unique as the first two air, the first, I mean, not the first, you know, the two airplane movies were unique. But you actually had a plot, you had a screenplay, actually. So they, these movies were actually very funny. Um, and, they done and 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 they were popular. They're funny. populated by jokes. They're populated by jokes that weren't a hundred percent takeoffs on movies that you've seen before. Right. Yeah. Like th- there there was actual humor that came from the characters. You know, Frank Drebin was a hysterical character. Norberg and his kind of clumsiness. Uh, you know, he was just as clumsy as he was when he killed Nicole. Uh, th- that was actually <laughs> actually funny in the next <laughs> 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 <laughs>
the other movie released that day is I and, and forgive me for saying I think one of the best movies ever made about the Holocaust. I agree. I mean, I love Schindler's List. Don't get me wrong, and I love the pianist. I mean, I'm not denigrating the films at all, but there are certain scenes in this movie. On um, the scene where, how do I say? It? There's a scene where the main character is in a class, and they say what it, the definition of an Aryan is, and he fits that, and he's yes. Jewish. And I and, and I remember watching this because I didn't get to see it in the theater, but I watched it on videotape when it first came out. And, you know, I couldn't stop laughing because I was like, my God, they think this guy's an Aryan? I mean, my God. And it's just such a well-done movie. And she turned out, she's an excellent director. Uh, and and you know, like this Holland, she's superb. I don't think she's made a bad movie yet. But this movie is so well, powerful. Well, she made the Arthur Rambo movie. Well, what movie? That Arthur Rambo movie with DiCaprio. Oh, wait. Oh, which right. one was that called? Which one was that called? Which one was that? <clears throat> Total Eclipse. Oh, yeah, yeah totally okay. Eclipse. You know, Aaron, you're absolutely right. I, I've only seen parts of that on cable. I think Bravo at the time, when Bravo is still a movie still. Um, you're absolutely... I, I, I stand corrected. Sorry. <laughs> but but uh, Europa Europa is obviously her her masterpiece. And, right. Well, and that's her calling card, because it got her uh, Secret Garden. Yeah, that's a good movie. That's a good movie. I like that movie. And now she's mostly doing television. She's mostly doing episodic television. Well, she I, I think she... I, he I made a movie didn't. called In Darkness, remember, a couple of years ago, about the um, the Jews who hid in the sewers. Um, I think oh, yeah. Poland. And that was a very good movie. That's a, a very, that was sort of like a, a redo of Canal, of, uh, the, of what, Andre Wydas' Canal. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what, what show does she usually do? Uh, uh, well, I just saw her name. I think she did an episode of... Um, she did an episode of Fargo, I think, this last this I, last season. I think you're right. I think okay. you're right. And um, so I I just see her name pop up occasionally. Like I know she did an episode of The Wire, which oh, that's you know. Right. So I mean, like she 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 pops up occasionally in in television. So, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned In Darkness because uh, it's good to know that she's still out there. But Europa no. Europa. If people have never seen this, this is a, probably a more amazing story than than Schindler's List is, frankly. In that, uh, and it's just an amazing survival story uh, and a kind of a one of a kind, uh, and also a great. I, I think the lead performance by Marco uh, Hofschneider, who's who's not, you know, I don't really see his name around anymore, but uh, uh, I think he's very good in it and. Uh, Julie Delphi is also extremely, extremely oh, good in it. Yeah, later on. no, no, she is. So uh, Europa, Europa, people. <laughs>